tonight, we are discussing our third topic. All humans have rights. Oh, what are they? We're going to talk about a topic that is very uh, viable and central to a lot of our culture nowadays. I'm going to pray, and we'll get going. Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, I thank you for each and every one of these students. I thank you for their intentionality of being here week in and week out. Um, I thank you for just the fact that they all have parts that want to hear things like this, that want to discuss things with other leaders and with their peers. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would bless our small groups tonight as we go to those. Uh, Father, I pray as we talk in here that you give me the words to say, that you give me wisdom as I speak, Lord, and that you give us all ears to hear what you have to say. It's in your son's name we pray. All right, so first, very quick review talking about the last couple weeks. Obviously our series is about apologetics, which means to defend your faith. As Paul, Peter, and Jude told us, you have to be ready, willing, and able to defend your faith. Because we live in a world that is hostile towards our faith. So, as they told us, always be really willing to give a defense, contending for the faith with gentleness and respect. And why do we do that? To encourage fellow believers and also to hopefully win unbelievers to the gospel. And then last week, we talked about truth. We talked about how the whole concept of my truth versus your truth, postmodernism, logically does not make sense, biblically is not accurate. There is an objective truth. The Bible reveals it to us. We talked about the analogy of Plato's cave and reality. Yes, my Marshall students, I'm sorry, you're tired of hearing about play this game. Uh, we talked about naturalism and scientism, these beliefs that our culture puts forward, essentially to deny where we say we get truth from. And then we looked, both in here and in our small groups, at Jesus telling us that he is the truth. We talked about why that's important. So we're going to build on those concepts tonight. We're going to talk more about why those things have meaning, but we're going to specifically tailor it to rights. And I want to say this before we get into our topic. I'm going to mention things tonight very briefly that have a lot of meaning to our culture, that are hotly debated in our culture, some that are even hotly debated among different churches. Most of these topics we are going to dive into the rest of this semester. So I appreciate that you probably have questions about each and every one of these individual topics. Save them. We're going to get into those. They're each going to have their own talks in the coming months. Then we'll have breakout groups to talk specifically about that issue. But I wanted to introduce them tonight. So when we're talking about human rights, basically the definition of human rights is the things that humans are given by being born. The things that every human is guaranteed or should be guaranteed just by being a person. But this has been debated and discussed literally since the time of Noah. In our own history, human rights are weaved into the fabric of America, what our country is. There's a British philosopher named John Locke who talked a lot about rights, liberty, everything that goes with human rights shortly before the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson, who would be our third president, and one of our founding fathers, the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, he was someone who read a lot of Locke's philosophy. It heavily impacted him and the other American founders in how they fought through human rights. So Locke said that every human is entitled to three things, life, liberty, and property. In other words, you have your own life, you are guaranteed for that life, you should not have that life violated. You are entitled to liberty, to some sort of freedom, and you're entitled to own property. Now, when the founding fathers looked at this as they were framing our country, they said, okay, we agree with life and liberty. Property is a little too big, though. Let's say life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's important to remember that our founders were coming from a biblical background. They were coming from a culture, a European society, where even if you didn't believe in Jesus, talk of scripture, talk of Jesus was all around. Everyone knew the Bible. Everyone knew scripture. So when they said 
life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they're thinking in the context of Christianity. Unfortunately, our culture today has drifted far from that. So if you go out on the street today and you say, hey, what is the pursuit of happiness? What is your right to happiness? You'll probably get 50 different answers if you ask 50 different people. Because we as a culture don't have a biblical center or a biblical core. So they said these rights are God given. They cannot be taken away. Are there problems with this stuff? Sure. Okay, you want to answer, Danny? Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Okay, very good. Yeah, technically, even though they said they can't be taken away, in writing the declaration, they're talking about how these rights have been violated. So yes, they realized these needed to be protected. If you look at Romans 13, we're not going to read all of this, but Paul here is talking to the Roman church who are being heavily persecuted. And the Roman church was asking him a question in the previous letter. Hey, Paul, should we follow our government? They seem to be taking away our rights as Christians. But what does Paul say? Paul says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. But you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. If you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God and avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjugation, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for authorities or ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So Paul here is saying, again, he's writing to a people living in the center of government that is actively killing Christians. This was written during the time of Emperor Nero, who would take Christians, put them on crosses, and light them on fire to light his gardens on fire. And yet, what does Paul say? These authorities have been instituted by God. God is not unaware that these people are in power. God still has power and control over them. And I want to emphasize this because in America, it doesn't matter whether you and your family are more politically left or politically right, we often elevate politics far above our own Christianity. Look at how many people, regardless of each side, constantly badmouth the other side's people when they get elected. Constantly talk about how we should rebel against those people. Constantly talk about how they're the most evil, horrible people ever. Or elevate their own person up to almost a godlike status. I'm guilty of this myself sometimes. Yes, politics matter. Yes, we are blessed to be in a country where we have an influence and we have a say in politics. But we also have a responsibility as Christians not to elevate politics above God. God is our ultimate authority. Christian is our ultimate identity. Politically conservative or politically liberal, Republican or Democrat, that is not our ultimate authority. That is not our ultimate identity. So I just wanted to say that. I'm guilty of that too sometimes. As we look at this, we need to realize, yes, we absolutely should speak out for what is right. In a couple months, we have an election in Ohio where we are going to be determining as a state whether or not abortion should be allowed in our state. Those of you who are going to be old enough to vote, I encourage you to vote in that. That's very important. Laura Kern's going to be coming in a couple months to talk about abortion and why should we should care about it as Christians. But at the end of the day, regardless of how that vote turns out, we need to realize that God's still in control. That God 
has a plan for even if things go against her way. We need to remember he's here. Politics matters, but it doesn't matter as much as that. It's not just the founders of the Constitution, though, uh, the country, the Declaration of Independence, that talk about human rights. About 60 years ago, the United Nations came together and they said, hey, let's publish a document talking about what human rights are. And this is what they had to say about human rights. They said, human rights include the right to life and liberty, freedom from slavery and torture, freedom of opinion and expression, the right to work and education, and many more. Everyone is entitled to these rights without discrimination. These rights are inherent to all human beings, regardless of race, sex, nationality, ethnicity, language, religion, or other status. That's what they have to say about this. I think there's a lot that's good there, but notice what's missing. The reason why. See, the United Nations can come together and they can come up with this. They can come up with this list of what human rights are and what they are called to. But without a why, this has no meaning. Without a reason for why this is valuable, it's got no standing. And this continues. They say five basic rights include the right to freedom of speech and expression, right to fair trial, right to free and unperturbed media, disturbing media, the right to vote freely in public and open elections, and the right to worship religion in a free setting. And again, without a why, this gets confusing. Right to freedom of expression? What if you're expressing something that violates someone else's right to expression? What if your right to worship religion in a free setting violates someone else's right to worship in a free setting? You see, while some of these are good things, some of these are noble things, without a common core holding those together, they come in conflict. There's no why. There's nothing that gives these rights meaning. And this, unfortunately, is why we are where we are as a society today, again, you could go ask 50 people on the street what you are entitled to, what your rights are as a human being, and those 50 people will probably give you some different answers. Look at how many people today are obsessed with the question of equity versus equality. Equity basically saying everyone deserves the exact same thing, and we should pull down people who have succeeded to put them on the same level of people who haven't. Look at free speech. Look at how many people, regardless of political party, say the worst things, post terrible things that do not build our culture up or aren't constructive, that violate each other's right to free speech. Again, abortion we're going to talk about in a couple, couple months, but look at how people are divided on whether they have a right to kill their baby. Look at how many people fight over not just should people get married, not just the importance of why marriage ever was a thing, but we fight about should people of the same sex be allowed to marry each other. Look at how many of these things that are supposed right have caused so much division in our society because we don't come from the same place. This all boils back to what we were talking about last week. The concept of my truth I get to say whatever I believe, whenever I believe it. And you have to appreciate that. If you're entitled to your truth, you can do whatever you want, you can believe whatever you want. Like we talked about last week, that just leads to division. Because again, there's no common core. There's nothing for it to rest on. There's no reason why, if I have different rights than Ethan, we should both be able to value our rights separately. There's no why behind it, it's just empty. And it just leads to what we've seen in our culture where people fight. If we left it there, that would be a pretty depressing end. It would be a pretty depressing place to live. Thankfully, as Christians, God tells us a few things which can encourage us, both in our own faith and as we interact with the culture. And this starts at the very beginning. In Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, the very creation of the first man, God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. Yes, every human being, including the unborn, has the right to life. Why? Because they're made in the image of their creator. We are made in the image of God. This is why you should not kill someone. Because in doing so, you're killing something, someone made in God's image. And God doesn't just stop there. After the flood, when he's making a covenant with Noah, he says in Genesis 9, From fellow man I will require reckoning for the life of blood. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. So again, you see from the very beginning of time, God emphasizes the biggest right we have is the right to life. And again, that begins at conception. That includes everyone, regardless of age, regardless of race, regardless of sex, regardless of disability, regardless of age. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. Every human being is made in God's image and thus has value and a right to life. And so Jesus takes this in a different direction. If you're just to look at Genesis, you're like, okay, I can see where the founders of America got that from. Like, that makes sense. But as Christians, we're called to use our rights in a different way. Specifically, we're called to serve others and give up our rights for others. In Mark 10, two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, come to him and they're like, hey, Jesus, if we get into your kingdom, can we sit on your right and left side, basically? Can we have the two, two greatest positions of power behind you in your kingdom? As you can imagine, the other disciples were not too thrilled with this question. And so this caused a giant feud among the, all the disciples. And Jesus gives them a long response. He'll examine this in small groups, but just a section from this. He says, You know those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. The great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. For whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man, that is Jesus, came not to be served but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus obviously knew what God said in Genesis. He was God. He values life clearly. Read the gospel and you can see how much he values life. Way more than most of the people in his day. How much he cared about children who were viewed as lowly. How much he cared about women who were viewed as second class. How much he cared for the disabled, the hurt, the broken. Those who were down, going down the wrong path. But notice what he says. He doesn't just say, yeah, you should value those people. He says, as Christian, you are to serve those people. You are to put to death your own desires for the good of those around you. He takes this one step further in John 14. He says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. See, guys, the Christian life, at the end of the day, yes, we need to be concerned about rights. Yes, human rights matter. I said earlier, it's important for us to be vocal and support of human rights. But what matters even more is our actions. Are you living a life where you're just concerned about your own rights? Or you're concerned for just what's just for you? Is it fair for me? Am I going to get the best outcome of this situation? Am I going to do something or be given something that makes me feel good or powerful or whatever it is? Or are you living a life that serves others? I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The, the real way we draw people into Christianity is not through our works. Yes, obviously people can be convicted by the gospel and are. But the real way that most people are drawn to Christianity is by seeing genuine Christians who live like Jesus, who lay down their lives, who aren't concerned about how my own rights can be protected. More concerned about how am I helping someone else? That's my challenge to you guys as we go out from here. Obviously, we're going to discuss this in small groups, but I want you thinking. The next several weeks, we're going to start to dive into some of these deeper topics. 
I want you guys to start thinking, how am I being rights? Am I being them through my rights and what makes me feel good? Or am I being them through the lens of a servant? Father, I, I thank you again for this evening. Lord, I thank you that not only do you give us rights, like the right to life, not only do you protect them, Lord, but Father, I thank you that through your Son, you gave us a model of what it means to be different from the world. And Lord, I pray for these students as they go home tonight, as they're in different friend groups, different schools, different work environments. Father, I pray they would start to live lives that stand out to those who are around them. That people through how they live their life would start to see you. And they become interested in you if they don't know you. And if they do know you, they would be encouraged in their own faith, Father. I pray that you would bless the discussions tonight in small group, that you would guide those discussions. And I thank you for that opportunity. It's in your son's name we pray.